Good morning and welcome. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around today. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or having any other technical difficulties, please send us an email for tech support to milfamln at gmail.com. As many, many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us today in the chat pod for conversation and for questions, as, as well as hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select that chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, we'd invite you to select the all panelists and attendees uh, response option from that drop down menu. It's right above where it says type message here. This just ensures everyone is able to view those questions as they come through in the chat pod. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. I'll now turn things over to my colleague, Robin Allen, who's the program coordinator with the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness Team to introduce our presenter panel today. Robin. Thank you, Coral. Uh, good morning. My name is Robin Allen, and I am the program coordinator for the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area. Today, I am very excited to introduce our presenters. Lieutenant Colonel Keel, MD, Chief of Air Force Medical Home Pediatrician, Air Force Medical Readiness Agency North, Defense Headquarters, Falls Church, Virginia, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense, Member Interest Group Co-Chair. Lieutenant Colonel Denton, RD, 382nd Training Squadron, Director of Operations, Air Education and Training Command Consultant Dietitian, 59th Training Group, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group Nominating Committee Chair, and her specialty, Development and Implementation of Plant-Based Nutrition Resources for Application Within Dietetics and Broader Health Care. And Lieutenant Colonel Howard, uh, Registered Dietitian, Nutritional Med Medicine Flight Commander, Air Mobility Command Consultant Dietitian, 60th Medical Group, Travis Air Force Base, California, Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, Nominating Committee, Chair-Elect, Specialty, Development and Implementation of Lifestyle Medicine Tools, Materials for Application in Dietetics across the Department of Defense. I will now turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Keel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having us today. I'll start by just stating that None of us have any conflicts of interest to disclose today. Here are our objectives, as you can see on the slide. We'll begin by discussing what lifestyle medicine is all about. We'll provide an overview of plant-based nutrition and some resources for you. And we'll also discuss some strategies on how to apply lifestyle medicine in your areas. So I'd like to begin this presentation today by defining lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is a therapeutic approach that addresses the primary root causes of chronic disease, focusing on evidence-based modalities that are highly effective and significantly lower in cost. Lifestyle medicine has been proven in research over the past 50 years to be an effective way to prevent, treat, and also to reverse chronic disease. However, it has been significantly underutilized in our United States healthcare system. There are six core principles of lifestyle medicine, which the evidence overwhelmingly supports make individuals healthier. As you can see here in this graphic slide, the first is choosing to eat primarily whole plant predominant foods, focusing on quality and quantity of sleep, getting regular and consistent physical activity, Minimizing and eliminating the use of risky substances, learning coping mechanisms for reducing stress, and also improving social connectedness. Lifestyle medicine incorporates a variety of techniques and principles to promote behavior change in individuals to help prevent and also reverse chronic disease. Lifestyle medicine practitioners partner with their patients over their specific health goals 
placing the patient at the center of their health by indicating to the patient that their health sits squarely in their own hand. Lifestyle medicine providers use evidence-based health information to guide patients toward their health goals, and they address the root cause of their medical condition first by focusing on the primary tenets of lifestyle medicine as the foundation of care. They use lifestyle medicine prescriptions to specify the behaviors that the patient agrees to change, and they utilize conventional medicine techniques as needed. They really function as a health coach in addition to a healthcare provider by using motivational interviewing techniques. And they partner with other healthcare team players, as you can see listed at the bottom of this slide, to help assist, support, and educate patients. It's really vital that the team speak the same language about lifestyle medicine when they're coaching patients towards better health. And in the next few slides, I'll emphasize how lifestyle medicine is very different from other forms of healthcare, including our traditional or conventional healthcare model, as well as other non-conventional healthcare models. Although our current health system includes treatment for addressing many of the core principles of lifestyle medicine, Conventional medicine treatment generally focuses on treating individual risk factors without consistently using lifestyle measures as the foundation of care. For example, healthcare providers are more likely to write a prescription for cholesterol lowering medication rather than to have a heart to heart conversation with their patients about radically changing their nutrition or starting an exercise program. The patient is simply a passive recipient of care and is not required to make major changes in their lives. We often tell patients to eat in moderation, but the science tells us that eating in moderation doesn't often help prevent or reverse chronic disease. With conventional medicine, the emphasis is on diagnosis and treatment with the goal being to simply manage the disease. Conventional medicine is a fragmented approach with many times the primary care provider referring out to subspecialists. Practitioners are not often united in their approach to treatment plans leaving patients confused and with the impression that the patient has no personal control over their health. Lifestyle medicine is a very different way to provide health care. It requires the patient to make major changes and to be an active partner in their care. For example, rather than telling the patient what they should do, the lifestyle medicine provider starts by asking the patient about their goals, maybe to be able to take a walk with their grandchild, or to be able to go on a vacation without needing to bring along their CPAP machine. The emphasis is on motivation and compliance with agreed upon behaviors. And the goal is on preventing, treating, and reversing their chronic disease rather than just the management of their disease. Another example, these practitioners are more likely to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with their patients about adopting a radical change in their nutrition. And practitioners actively use lifestyle medicine prescriptions rather than always using medication prescriptions to prescribe specific detailed lifestyle medicine interventions to their patients, such as nutrition prescriptions and exercise prescriptions. And as I stated earlier, lifestyle medicine uses a team of professionals all speaking the same language and partnering with the patient to assist with making changes. Other non-traditional approaches to patient care include integrative medicine, functional medicine, naturopathy, and homeopathy. Lifestyle medicine differs from these in that it is always focused on evidence-based practices. The patient is always an active participant in their care and the underlying lifestyle causes are the foundation of treatment rather than the symptoms or signs of disease. If you haven't noticed yet, we have a serious problem in our American healthcare system. As you can see, the sick care system to service sick people is really breaking our bank and we need a radical idea to change the approach to medicine. And by radical, I mean its true definition and meaning from the root or the foundation, one that is simple and intrinsic. However, we recognize that this is not necessarily gonna be easy to implement. Everyone worries about their protein intake, but the bigger issue is their lack of fiber intake. The CDC reports that just one in 10 adults meet the federal fruit or re vegetable recommendations. Depending on their age and sex, federal guidelines recommend that adults eat at least two to three cups per day of vegetables as part of a healthy eating pattern. But data shows that just 9% of adults meet these recommendations. You can see this very low level of vegetable intake across our country reflected in this pictorial from the CDC. 
This chronic disease epidemic is primarily caused by poor diet. Our standard American diet, otherwise known as SAD, has now surpassed tobacco as the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Other top killers include heart disease, comprising both high blood pressure and high cholesterol, diabetes, cancer, and stroke. All of these conditions are preventable and often reversible with lifestyle changes alone. So what does this have to do with military medicine? Well, over the past 25 years, rates of obesity and overweight in the military have increased by 20% as indicated in a study by the RAND Corporation. And the DOD spends $1.5 billion each year on healthcare costs related to obesity alone for active duty members, veterans, and their families. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has recommendations for treatment of obesity, which states for clinicians to offer or refer adults to intensive multi-component behavioral interventions. But few military treatment facilities readily use these services, and many locations do not have formal programs available within the MTF or civilian community that can fill this gap. Given the urgent need to turn this sick care system around, to improve the health and longevity of our active duty members and other beneficiaries, and to drastically reduce the costs required to sustain it, the Defense Health Agency and Military Health System Quadruple AIM focuses on these four areas as listed on the slide. Lifestyle medicine stands to improve all of these outcomes and have been proven in numerous studies within our civilian communities to improve health and offer better care at an overwhelming reduction in cost as well as having a significant return on investment. Research is currently undergoing within the military sector to show how lifestyle medicine may have a profound impact on our health and to improve readiness. We all know someone, or perhaps we ourselves, have struggled with high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, or cancer. It's been proven that 80% of heart disease, type two diabetes, and stroke as well as 40% of cancers can be prevented through improvements to diet and lifestyle. And as I said previously, lifestyle medicine focuses on the root causes of chronic diseases to prevent and reverse the problem, rather than using a Band-Aid to diminish or cover up the symptoms of disease. Numerous studies over the past 50 years have shown that lifestyle medicine can reverse already existing disease and allow for organ healing such that patients can reduce or eliminate the need for their typical prescription medications. There are many, many lifestyle medicine trailblazers who have treated thousands of patients over the years with lifestyle medicine and have published their results. One example of such a trailblazer is Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who is highlighted on this slide. Dr. Esselstyn is a former surgeon who has been incorporating lifestyle medicine into his practice and research for the last 30 years. Dr. Esselstyn has published multiple studies showing the power of a whole foods plant-based diet to effectively restore normal blood flow to the heart and coronary arteries in patients with previous cardiovascular disease. His profound results showed what an impact plant-based nutritional intervention has on cardiac blood flow, which you can see on the left side of the graphic after just three weeks of intervention. Additionally, after 32 months, you can see on the right side of the graphic that the coronary artery, which was significantly narrowed due to atherosclerotic plaques, was opened up and actually regained its normal configuration without any use of cholesterol-lowering medication. Remarkably, this was done by using food as medicine. Another pioneer in the lifestyle medicine field is Dr. Dean Ornish, an internal medicine physician who began incorporating lifestyle medicine techniques into his practice quite early in his career. In 1990, he published his first results of the Lifestyle Heart Trial, which focused on cardiac rehab treatment using a whole foods, plant-based diet, smoking cessation, moderate exercise, stress reduction with the incorporation of things like yoga and meditation, as well as psychological support. In this study, Dr. Ornish showed that after one year of treatment, there were significant regressions of atherosclerotic plaques in the patient's hearts and what's even more exciting is that after five years, these patients continued to show regression of their plaques and had half the rate of cardiac events compared with the control group. 
Dr. Ornish has continued to conduct research over the past 35 years showing that changes in diet and lifestyle can make a powerful difference in our health and well being. Medicare and many insurance companies are now covering Dr. Ornish's lifestyle medicine program for reversing chronic disease because it consistently achieves bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, larger cost savings, and greater adherence than have ever been reported. This was the first preventive healthcare program to be covered by insurance, and it is hoped that we will be able to introduce more preventive care services to patients covered by insurance in this way. Now that we've discussed successes in how lifestyle medicine can prevent, treat, and also reverse chronic disease, I'd like to turn your attention to our current healthcare system. This graph shows the breakdown of premature deaths in the United States by their co primary contributing factors. As you can see, our US healthcare system is only contributing by up to 20% to our net longevity and health. It should seem very ironic that the United States spends more on healthcare than any other nation, yet we rank poorly on nearly every measure of health status. Conventional medicine has historically held that the primary impacts to health are technological advances such as medications and immunizations. While these advances are certainly remarkable, it is clear as you can see from this graph that health behaviors play a significantly larger role in prevention of premature death in this day and age, up to 30 to 40% in some studies, more than double what healthcare contributes to, with an enormous proportion of early deaths caused by obesity, sedentary behavior, and smoking. Lifestyle medicine has proven that with the right tools, patient behavior is susceptible to change. For us to be effective as healthcare professionals, the evidence shows that our future healthcare model needs to incorporate a multitude of evidence-based therapeutic modalities to help impact the course of disease in these other areas outside of strictly clinical care if we want to have any impact on the other 80 to 90% over how health and longevity occur. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Colonel Keel. Uh, we have mostly comments. Um, I, I think processed foods, Kathy says, I think processed food is the problem, not lack of vegetables or too much protein. And um, another comment, a lack of plant-based foods. What do you think about those comments? So I think uh, we've seen that many folks who certainly eat a lot of processed foods, what they're in effect doing is crowding out their plate so that they don't, they aren't able to get the volume of plant-based uh, nutrition that we expect would lead to prevention and reversal of chronic disease. So our aim is really to educate patients on making the shift away from processed and packaged foods uh, to a more plant predominant diet. So, and uh, Karen said, teaching people how to prepare foods that are affordable and taste good. How do we do more of this in the military? I think that's a great question and certainly something that each of our lifestyle and performance medicine clinical sites is working on as we speak. And I think it's taking a team approach really in how we deliver this information to patients and make it exciting and effective for them. Um, so our, our last speaker will speak more about this, Colonel Harward, but certainly uh, using a multidisciplinary team of folks to incorporate that educational information um, at not just within our medical care system, but even outside of that to our military population is gonna be key. And uh, this is very helpful. Recognizing barriers to access to healthy foods is important to affordability, food deserts, et cetera. And then Ellie says, makes me think about food court choices and how dominant bad food co food choices are and how good choices are not available. I completely agree with those statements that certainly, you know, we know in the civilian sector, we struggle with this, but we're not immune to it by any means in our military population, because if you look around we're, um, you know, we have fast food everywhere. And what we really are working toward is how can we make the healthy choice, the easy choice by 
you know, everyone's busy and everybody's looking at how to incorporate these techniques into our everyday lives. And I think we do need to look at the food options available to us on a regular basis to help minimize the processed options and make it more healthful um, to, re to relieve our food desert issues that we currently have. Thank you for those comments. Great, thank you. I will now turn this over to Lieutenant Colonel Denton. Hello, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, the first core principle of lifestyle medicine is to eat a whole food plant-based diet, as we've discussed. Today, I will provide you with an overview of plant-based nutrition and professional resources for working with patients. Most of the slides that I have have references at the bottom of them. Please note that they're there for your use in the future when you have access to the slides. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has not defined the term plant-based yet, but this terminology has risen in popularity to describe diets on a vegetarian spectrum. There are other emerging terms that describe this as well, but the bottom line is that a plant-based diet is a diet that is to some degree vegetarian and based around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, which includes beans, peas, and lentils, nuts, and seeds, and to some degree excludes or minimizes animal products. The Academy regularly publishes a position paper on vegetarian diets. The most recent update was in December of 2016. They define vegetarian diets as they are spelled out on this slide. Each of these categories are devoid of flesh foods but may contain dairy or eggs. A vegan diet excludes all animal products. Notice that the terms pescatarian, someone who eats only fish, and flexitarian, someone who only sometimes eats meat or fish, are not included on this chart because they are technically not vegetarian diets. However, we would consider them on the plant-based spectrum. The Academy is the United States' largest organization of food and nutrition professionals and represents over a practitioners. Their position paper will be central to the information I cover today because it is evidence-based. The Academy's stance is that appropriately planned vegetarian and vegan diets are healthy and nutritionally adequate for all stages of the life cycle. It's interesting to note that the 2016 update to their position paper added a comment that plant-based diets are more environmentally sustainable than diets rich in animal products because they use fewer natural resources and are associated with much less environmental damage. Per the Code of Ethics, dietitians are mandated to protect public health by understanding and promoting food systems that protect biodiversity and care for the planet. Another place to look for information on this topic is the Eat Lancet Commission on Food, Planet, and Health. 37 of the world's leading scientists came together to answer the question, can we feed a future population of 10 billion people a healthy diet within planetary boundaries? The answer to that question is yes, we can, if plants become the new main course. I've included a direct link to a two minute video that summarizes their findings that I encourage you to view after today's presentation. There are two gold standard studies to review when considering diet health and longevity, the Adventist Health Study and Epic Oxford. The Adventist study began in 2001 and is ongoing. Loma Linda University School of Public Health has analyzed 96,000 Seventh-day Adventists. They're an interesting population to study because their faith discourages the use of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, and encourages avoiding refined foods and sweeteners. So at baseline, these are health conscious individuals who have different dietary patterns. So it's easy to compare how those impact their overall health. This study shows us that vegetarian diets are associated with significant reductions in risk for heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. On this slide, you will see that the only group that had a mean BMI in the normal range were those following a vegan diet. Non-vegetarians had more than twice the prevalence of diabetes compared with lacto-ovo vegetarians and vegans, even after correcting for body mass index. Among those who were free of diabetes, when BMI and confounding factors were adjusted for, vegans were 62% less likely to develop diabetes and lacto-ovo vegetarians were 38% less likely. Next, we have the Epic Oxford study that was initiated in 1993 and is ongoing. It recruited 65,000 men and women in the United Kingdom and nearly half of the participants are vegetarian or vegan. 
Their findings further support favorable outcomes amongst vegetarians and vegans. Lacto-ovo vegetarians and vegans were 32% less likely to develop heart disease versus health conscious omnivores. Just this November, Epic Oxford published a study on fracture risk and determined that fish eaters, vegetarians, and vegans are at a higher risk for bone fractures, even when controlling for body mass index, protein intake, and calcium intake. Vegans had a 43% higher risk of fractures, and risk was most significant in postmenopausal women with low body mass index and low physical activity levels. Hormone replacement therapy protects against bone loss, loss in postmenopausal women, and only 5.6% of vegan women took it versus 26.7% of the meat-eating women in the study. The author stated that risk differences were likely due partly to lower BMI and possibly to lower intakes of calcium and protein, and that more research is needed. Limitations of the study included that most participants were white European women, the authors had no data on vitamin D or calcium intake or on overall diet quality. Study participants consumed about 20 to 22 grams of fiber a day, which may be more than the average American, but still suboptimal. We must ensure patients meet nutrient requirements for fiber, protein, calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin B12, and get adequate physical activity that includes weight-bearing exercise. Epic Oxford will continue to produce more specific information about the effects of diet on long-term health, and we should pay attention. Longevity hotspots known as the blue zones became popular due to a National Geographic article in 2005. And there's a direct link to it on the slide, if you'd like to read the original article. These are regions of the world where people live long and healthy lives and have high concentrations of centenarians. The regions listed on the slide include the previously mentioned Seventh-day Adventist population in California. The commonalities that these regions share include things like engaging in constant moderate physical activity, having a strong sense of purpose and faith, and nourishing close relationships with family and within communities. You can read all about these at the Power Nine link provided, but to summarize the dietary components, each of these communities consumes a diet that is dominated by whole plant foods and incorporates beans on a daily basis. They also tend to apply the practice of stopping eating when they are 80% full. It is theorized that life expectancy could increase by 10 to 12 years by adopting these lifestyle habits. And these are the exact habits that lifestyle medicine promotes and encourages. If you'd like to learn more, you can also check out Down to Earth with Zac Efron, a new show on Netflix, episode four, features an episode on Sardinia. Most practitioners do not specialize in vegetarian nutrition, but should aim to achieve a level of comfort with this population. This is a short list to focus on. Know what kind of plant-based diet someone is trying to follow. Understand their why. Is it health, environment, animal welfare? Someone who is vegan for ethical reasons may follow a much less nutritionally balanced version of the diet versus someone motivated by health. This may be the case with those in the Epic Oxford study who tend to eat a plant-based diet more so for ethical reasons and therefore still eat a highly processed diet so it doesn't provide as much benefit. Build rapport and exercise compassion with patients. They may have barriers against you as a health professional assuming that you won't understand them and where they're coming from. Use evidence-based resources like the ones presented today and know where your client gets their information. Um, you may or may not agree with where they're getting it from. Keep it simple, meaning that the foods people eat don't have to be complex recipes all of the time. Beans and rice and vegetables with various sauces can go a long way to help people meet uh, nutritional needs in day-to-day -day life. Back to the position paper. It covers several key nutrients and disease states, but for today, I will cover the nutrients listed in bold due to time limitations. First, protein. The paper states that those following vegetarian and vegan diets typically meet or exceed protein requirements when adequate calories are consumed. The liver stores and provides amino acids over the course of a day to ensure adequate nitrogen retention and use, which is why there is no need to eat complementing essential amino acid sources at every meal to provide, quote, complete proteins, an antiquated notion that still persists in dietetics. As long as we eat a variety of foods over time and calorie needs are met, essential amino acid needs are met as well. 
There are also protein scoring methods that look at our ability to digest and absorb amino acids from different food sources. Because of these, we know that those following a vegan diet or a 100% plant-based diet require a slightly higher amount of protein, likely 10% above the RDA. It's important to know that all plant foods contain all essential amino acids in various amounts. Consuming legumes is helpful because they are rich in the essential amino acid lysine, which is lower in other plant-based foods. Again, protein needs are met when we eat a variety of foods that includes legumes and we eat enough calories. This slide provides ideas on how to compose meals that contain plant-based proteins. Remember that whole grain products and vegetables also provide protein. At the bottom of the slide, you will find links to lists of plant-based protein sources, both by dietitians Sharon Palmer and Reed Mangles, who specialize in this area. The next nutrient is iron, because iron deficiency anemia is one of the most common nutrient deficiencies in the world. There are two dietary sources of iron, heme and non-heme. Heme iron is found only in animal sources and is well absorbed. However, some research shows that high heme iron intake and high iron stores have been associated with insulin resistance and heart disease. Non-heme iron is found mainly in plants and the body increases its absorption when it senses that stores of iron are low. Due to reduced bioavailability of non-heme iron, it's recommended that vegetarian and vegans consume 1.8 times the RDA for iron. Recommendations to increase iron absorption are listed on this slide and are mainly a review for dietitians who are listening. The good news is that studies suggest that vegetarians and vegans tend to have adequate iron stores. This slide is a nice summary of vitamin C and iron combinations. Many of these foods naturally pair well together with a little bit of planning. And plant-based sources of iron include grains, legumes, leafy greens, tofu, nuts, seeds, and enriched cereals. The next nutrient of concern is calcium due to its importance for bone health, muscle, and nerve function. The Academy's paper states that lacto-ovo-vegetarians typically meet or exceed recommended calcium intakes, but that intakes of vegans vary widely and are often suboptimal, ranging from 400 to 800 milligrams a day. As mentioned earlier, the Epic Oxford study recently found a higher risk of fractures amongst non-meat eaters. Previous Epic Oxford results suggested if calcium intake was over 525 milligrams a day, fracture risk was not increased. And when the Academy's position paper is updated, these outcomes will likely be included to guide future practice. In the Adventist study, vegetarians and vegans with higher protein intakes from legumes and meat analogs had lower risk for hip, for hip fractures. Adequate lysine is of particular significance as it is an important essential amino acid in bone collagen production. For all of these reasons, clients should strive to meet the recommended daily intake for calcium. Dietary sources of calcium are listed here. Calcium is poorly absorbed from spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens, despite their high calcium content due to their high oxalate content. So they should not be relied on as a source of calcium. Supplemental calcium may be helpful to meet needs and for almost everyone, taking a daily vitamin D supplement that provides 600 to 1000 international units daily is ideal to aid calcium absorption. Finally, a reliable source of vitamin B12 is needed for healthy nerves and blood and to prevent elevated homocysteine levels. Elevated homocysteine is linked to cardiovascular disease, poor cognition, and low bone mineral density. B12 is not made by animals or plants, but by bacteria. Meat and dairy products contain traces of B12 because an animal's intestinal tract has bacteria that produce it. However, thanks to modern hygiene practices, no unfortified plant food contains B12. Also, many or older people do not produce enough stomach acid to separate B12 from the protein it's bound to, and common medications interfere with B12 absorption, making this a nutrient of concern for adults over 50 as well. For all of these reasons, the simplest thing to do is to take a supplement and regularly assess lab values. It's wise for vegetarians and non-vegetarians to take a daily multivitamin that provides at least 100% of the daily value for B12, though people may choose to opt for fortified foods and a single nutrient supplement. Options for supplementation are listed on this slide. 
The next few slides provided give links to professional resources that I highly encourage you to explore. I'd like to mention specifically that the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group provides wonderful educational handouts online for consumers. No membership is required to access them and they're free. For those who are members of the Dietetic Practice Group, there is an RD version of all of the handouts available. All of these resources are provided in the toolbox compiled to accompany today's webinar. There's some more links, more links. My final slide provides professional references to have on hand if you'd like to gain confidence and competence in this space. For dietitians who may be interested, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics offers a certification course in vegetarian nutrition. And I'm happy to take any questions that have come in while I've been speaking. Thank, Thank you, you, Lieutenant Colonel Denton. Uh, a few questions and comments. Um, Amy would like to know, what would it take to, char to change policy for foods served at the DFAC? And I had to look that up. That's the chow hall. Is it something that is in the works at all? There are always teams of dietitians working on improving dining facility food service operations. And it really depends where you work and uh, what installation you're on. And, but if you ask, I'm sure they're coordinating with somebody. And most dining facilities follow standard menus and there are many programs in, pla in place to improve them. But you can also influence change by asking the question specifically where you are. And, and lifestyle medicine to me is also about not just using the voice I have as a dietitian and our team of dietitians that are always working hard to make improvements just feverishly. Uh, we need all ancillary providers to be on the same page and using their voices as well. Um, and I don't know if any of the other panelists would like to, to add anything to my comments, but um, it probably depends where you are. But most DFACs are working towards having salad bars and healthier cooked vegetables. And our role can be guiding people towards the choices that are available. Because if you look, sometimes there's more there than you realize. But if you're not looking, you may assume that, there's, that it's not there. So we've heard from other um, presenters before that they are they also working on placement of foods to influence food choices or do you have yes. an answer to this? Yes, ma'am. I mean, some dining facilities will place the vegetable choices as the first option on the line just to make sure somebody has to say no to vegetables first off before they even choose their entree or they have an opportunity to say yes. You know, there's good, they'll go for green initiatives across many dining facilities that are highlighting those healthier options that are higher in fiber, lower in fat, and, and making the healthy choice the easier choice. Excellent. Uh, and I apologize, sometimes there's just initials up here. I, um, someone wants to know, that's antiquated. I think she's talking about the complimentary here. She's talking about the complimentary proteins at each meal. Yes, ma'am. I did see that. I did see that pop in and I don't mean to be insulting and using the term antiquated, but I've, I've heard in practice dietitians counseling patients to make sure you combine beans and rice at a meal and you don't really need to do that. What you need to do is ensure over the course of time, a day, a week, you're getting enough protein, enough variety. And when I went through college, I remember being taught you because it's based on a book by that was written in the seventies about combining protein sources at meals to make sure you have a complete protein every time you sit down to have a meal. And now we know that that's not really necessary. Um, it's not that you don't need to balance your diet. That's not what I mean. I mean, um, it doesn't have to be every single meal you have, you know, one source of a certain set of essential amino acids and a source of another beans and rice do pair well together because beans are amazing and they provide some of those limiting essential amino acids that aren't present in other foods like lysine um, is in beans, but it's not very rich in other plant-based foods like rice and other vegetables. So it's not that it's not important. It's just not necessary at each meal to pair your amino acids perfectly because your body can balance it out over time. Great. Kendra uh, says our DFAC does not provide many plant-based options, but they tell me they have a menu they have to follow. Any recommendations? I would say that the standard menus are reviewed by dietitians. Usually, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe all of them go through some kind of office where a dietitian has laid eyes on it to balance it. Um, you can speak with the manager, see if you can have any influence locally, because sometimes a local squeaky wheel can get more done than you would 
you would think. Yeah, and, and this is Colonel Keel. I'll just echo that, that we've had multiple uh, locations around our Air Force community that have had success with just bringing up the conversation uh, to leadership in that space to make changes at the, the level of the DFAC. So I would definitely bring it up. Great. Uh, we have more questions coming in, but we we're going to have time at the end to uh, finish up these questions. So I will now turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Harward. Great. Thank you. The Air Force Lifestyle and Performance Medicine Working Group was officially recognized in July of 2020. It has been endorsed by the AFMS and the Office of the Surgeon General. It currently consists of 18 members from a variety of medical specialties whose goals are to develop the lifestyle medicine platform under the Air Force preventive medicine field and to standardize lifestyle medicine clinics and education throughout the Air Force and hopefully across the MHS in the future. We have lifestyle and performance medicine clinics at five MTFs currently and many more interested in setting up a clinic. We are developing a toolkit of existing methodologies from a variety of evidence-based sources to implement at other MTFs, focusing on improving readiness of our active duty population, as well as the health of our beneficiaries. Trying to advance the slide. There we go. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is the medical professional society providing quality education and certification to those dedicated to clinical and worksite practice of lifestyle medicine as the foundation of a transformed and sustainable healthcare system. ACLM addresses the need for quality education and certification of the clinical practice in lifestyle medicine. Although ACLM was founded in 2004, it has experienced a 500% growth in healthcare provider membership in the last five years, which speaks to the overwhelming recognition that providers have over the need of lifestyle medicine and healthcare. Through the development and promotion of educational events, tools, resources, and campaigns designed to further the cause of lifestyle medicine, ACLM supports its members in their individual practice and in their collective desire to domestically and globally promote lifestyle medicine as the first treatment option, as opposed to a first option of treating symptoms and consequences with expensive and increasing quantities of pills and procedures. ACLM members are united in their desire to identify and eradicate the cause of disease. They offer certification in professional development opportunities as well as CME and educational webinars. A number of our Air Force healthcare practitioners have either obtained certification or are seeking certification through ACLM. ACLM has many resources if you are a member, such as actual class presentations, assessment forms, and briefings to leadership to help them understand lifestyle medicine. If you are not a member, they do have free webinars as well. In addition, an ACLM member, Dr. Motley, created a website for free lifestyle medicine tools, and the URL is located in the slide. When I first learned of lifestyle medicine and new to my current assignment, the first thing I did was find doctors and specialists who also valued this concept. I found them in oncology, pulmonology, endocrinology, cardiology, behavioral health, and of course, primary care. I first went and spoke to the SGH and he was 100% supportive and so was my boss. I used the health and readiness optimization report to show his leadership the problem at base level. I'll show a picture of this in the upcoming slides. The key is to have it written into policy so when you leave, the program doesn't leave. Fortunately, the vice wing commander was 100% committed as well. Across the AFMS, multiple MTFs have established lifestyle and performance medicine clinics within their primary care clinics after practitioners have realized the value and profound health improvements that are seen in incorporating the foundations of lifestyle medicine. 
Travis Air Force Base established our Lifestyle and Performance Medicine Program in 2019 in conjunction with the SGH. Since then, we have had over 25 healthcare providers assist in developing this multidisciplinary clinic as an extension to primary care. We began our first group clinic in October of 2020 with nine patients. We are still waiting on all the patients to get their lab results, but one patient cut her lipid panel in half. Also as a class, they lost a combined total of 30 pounds. We are currently partnering with the clinical investigation flight to conduct research on lifestyle medicine and how it improves readiness. When we start the next cohort in January, we will bring in the primary care providers and discuss the patient as a team so we have a better understanding on how the patient is progressing and not just left to read progress notes. Although lifestyle medicine has been in existence for decades, it is in its infancy as a formal collaborative effort in military medicine. As we highlight, oh, excuse me. Okay, next slide. Using the data we have to help make changes, many of you from the Air Force have seen this HERO report, which was first developed in 2018. It begins to place better attention on some of the behaviors that we know significantly impact health and disease. You can see that many of the metrics align with the lifestyle medicine core tenets, but the missing link that our lifestyle and performance medicine working group is trying to affect are to educate our healthcare professionals that there is a solid evidence that supports the overwhelming impact that lifestyle medicine can have on disease treatment and prevention. And lastly, to train our healthcare professionals on how to have the conversation with their patients, how they can help motivate patients to make changes rather than always reaching for the prescription pad. Okay. So now we're gonna launch into a lifestyle and performance medicine case study, showcasing the incredible journey of Major Leroy Jackson, who of course allowed us to share his story with permission. He was seen for his first lifestyle and performance medicine cons consultation at the Air Force Academy. And this slide shows his baseline labs. At the age of 35, Major Jackson was trending toward obesity his bad cholesterol alone was 223, and the biggest kicker of all, he was soon after pulled from his deployment due to new diagnosis of diabetes type two. Worth mentioning, after four years of lifestyle and performance medicine at the academy, nearly 90% of the service members who have come through the consultation clinic have lab work that looks like this. Most people failing, falling in the significantly pre-diabetic A1C range. The military population is not exempt from these chronic medical issues. In fact, these are stacking up over time. We presume overconfidently that these issues do not affect the healthiest of the healthy. Please hear this. Without question, Major Jackson was in a severely de-optimized health state. However, the biggest threat to us as a military institution, he was no longer deployment ready. So Major Jackson was given two options. He could approach his health issues in one of two ways. He could either use plants or pills to address his hypertension, hyperlipidemia, unhealthy weight, diabetes, and insulin resistance. He could choose either to apply a Band-Aid or address the root cause of his health problems. Spoiler alert folks, he chose his food as his medicine. So what does, what did he do? Like most lifestyle patients, he starts simply and sustainably for four, sh or excuse me, for seven short days, he changes his food to a plant-based diet. After seven short days, he dropped his LDL 55 points. He was feeling so good, he wanted to keep going. So at 14 days, he dropped an additional 28. And his total change in LDL was a drop of 83 points. His changes are similar, if not better, than pharmacotherapy. 
His A1C and lipid panels are not routinely ordered weekly, but this shows that lifestyle changes can have rapid and dramatic impacts on objective health measures. He not only lost weight, but he started having more energy and mental clarity. He noted better sleep quality and exercise stamina. He also had an improved quality of life and felt that his family was coming on board with the healthy changes. So at six weeks, as you can see, after six weeks, Major Jackson was able to drop his hemoglobin A1C from the full-blown diabetes range down into the pre-diabetic range. He effectively and reversed his diabetes without any medications. He used food as medicine. These are Major Jackson's summary lab results showing significant improvements in cholesterol and A1C over the course of just two months. As a truly activated patient starting in February of 2019, he was able to reclaim his health and achieve some pretty remarkable goals as you can appreciate here. However, Major Jackson started experiencing what we like to refer to as the upward spiral, the positive side effects. His brain fog was gone, his energy significantly increased, his sleep was better, more restorative, he could work out harder and recover more quickly. He is the ultimate patient who tests piloted lifestyle medicine on himself and is now living the results every day. But most importantly here, he went back into the pool for deployability. Major Leroy Jackson states, for me, the plant-based lifestyle is about prioritizing my health over my habits. My body feels better, my children are embraced the dietary changes and are conscious about what they're putting in their bodies. The Veterans Health Administration since 2016 has implemented and expanded their whole health program at many of their facilities. The whole health program is a whole body approach to health and well being, which considers the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and environmental needs of veterans. They focus on getting to know what their patients' goals are and empowering them to make positive health changes towards these goals. They incorporate other health modalities, including acupuncture, yoga, massage, tai chi, and many others to help develop a personalized health plan based on the patient's values and needs. There we go. In 2019, the Army developed and initiated their Holistic Health and Fitness Program, or H2F which incorporates many of these tenets of lifestyle medicine to help coach, teach, and also rehabilitate soldiers. They utilize a wide variety of skilled professionals to instill education and behavior changes, which include some of these lifestyle medicine techniques that we've discussed. The Marine Corps also has a similar program called Semper Fit, which includes some of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. The ACLM's member interest group was founded in 2017 by Dr. Regman Stigman and Dr. Reddy, a VA partner. The group's mission is to unite DOD and VA thought leaders who are interested in building and expanding lifestyle medicine efforts through collaboration worldwide. To date, the group has over 60 members working to improve the lives and wellness of active duty members and veterans through lifestyle medicine foundations. As you can see, there are many folks working toward this important effort. However, we have a number of obstacles also working against us, including the lack of availability of quality food sources, the hustle and bustle of military work life that doesn't lend itself to easily prioritizing lifestyle interventions, the lack of leadership buy-in and incorporation of these values into their own lives, and our military culture, which tends to downplay the importance of these basic lifestyle foundations not recognizing how vital they are to our performance as humans. Yet with improvement by so many institutions to incorporate lifestyle changes as foundational care of clinicians and in collaboration with our patients and multidisciplinary teams, 
it is hopeful that we can make some headway in improving the health in, of our current and former military members, as well as their families. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Howard. I love that case study and real life application and success. Uh, just a few questions from Alexa. An A1C is taken every three months for accuracy, correct? Great to see lab improvements. Right, yeah, so the human globin A1C goes um, back three months. And so um, the provider decided to um, take it a little bit more um, sooner than that. Excellent. And this is from uh, the previous section, but anyone can uh, ask if a patient, or anyone can answer, if a patient wants to find out what their micronutrient levels are, do we simply encourage them to ask their PCP to get it done? Yeah, I can take that. This okay, is thank ideal. you. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great place to start is have them reach back to their primary care provider to explain their concerns and what they'd like to request as far as blood work. And uh, it's a great learning opportunity many times for primary care providers who may not have a very good understanding about lifestyle medicine in general. Great. And Katie says, uh, go for green program addresses healthier menu, food placement, marketing, promotion of healthier choices and dining facility and gives the link. Link. Thank you, Katie. And uh, Seeger, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, a lot of can't be very well tested by lab work. What can't be tested by lab work? I'm sorry. A lot of nutrients. Oh, yes. But I, I think it's important to also look at the lipid panel and I mean, not only at Travis, are, um, someone cut their LDL in half, and then um, the case study showed that he went from a diabetes state to a pre-diabetes state. So just looking at those measures also is very helpful. Great. Thank this you, everyone. Colonel, Colonel Denton, I just wanted to add, if somebody is going to follow a completely plant-based diet, the number one nutrient I would recommend they ask their provider about being tested for is vitamin B12. It can take years to develop a deficiency. And in most cases, you'll be okay if you're eating fortified foods and taking a multivitamin that has B12 in it. It's just something that um, not everybody's familiar with. And it, it's good to be proactive and ask for those kind of checks. Thank you, Colonel Keel. Uh, in interest of time, we've got to need to wrap this up. You can keep your comments and questions coming in and uh, we can attempt to answer them if we have time at the very end but uh, we are gonna move along. Thank you, Colonel Keel, Colonel Denton and Colonel Howard. This was fascinating. And I, again, I love the case study. And thank you uh, all the participants for sharing your comments and questions. We appreciate your participation. Uh, upcoming events, nutrition and wellness team is very happy to present to bring to you this upcoming webinar, the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, New Revisions and Uses, Wednesday, January 27th, 2021 at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Continuing education, Nutrition and Wellness is offering one CPEU for registered dietitians and dietetic technicians for today's webinar. To receive your CDR CPEU certificate, please visit the webinar event page. The link is on this slide. You will find a purple evaluation link on the event page. After completing the evaluation, you'll be directed to fill in your name and email. Your CPEU certificate will be emailed to you. Government addresses such as .mil and .gov frequently will not accept automated email, so please use a personal email address if you can. Any questions about your certificate, please contact Kristen DeFilippo and her email is listed on this slide. A recording of today's webinar will be archived within 48 hours to our YouTube channel, which you can access via the event page. We invite you to connect with the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness Team. You can subscribe to our listserv on our website to receive quarterly newsletter and other information regarding upcoming webinars. Also follow us on Twitter for webinar reminders and information related to nutrition, physical activity, and overall well-being. I will now turn it back over to Coral. Thank you, Robin. I wanted to echo Robin's thanks to our stellar presenter panel, as well as to everyone who contributed comments and questions and feedback in, 
<clears throat> excuse me, in the chat pod today. Uh, we're going to stay on for just a moment or two more. However, as Robin mentioned, if you have any follow-up questions regarding continuing education, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Nutrition Wellness team via the email here on the slide. Thanks again for tuning in and uh, don't forget to share this recording, which will be available in the next day or two with anyone who may be interested. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the new year.